as soon as our panel finishes introducing themselves to one another. Hi. Um, I think we're good, but thanks for asking. Um, hi. Uh, thanks so much for coming um, here to New America this afternoon. My name is Kevin Carey. I'm the director of the education uh, policy program here. We are very pleased to co-host this event along with our uh, longtime friends and partners at Washington Monthly Magazine. Um, the subject of today's discussion is innovation in higher education. This is um, an issue that is very, very close to the center of how we think and how we work here at New America. We are a, an organization dedicated to uh, renewing America's promise in the digital age. Um, uh, as you can see, because it's stenciled on the wall outside the, the room we're in right now. Um, we see innovation as indispensable to achieving the um, goals we have for our nation um, for education. Uh, you know, we're living in a time when higher education opportunity is probably a more important part of the national public conversation than it has ever been. Um, it is a major um, debate. It is one of the ways that people are making choices about who their elected leaders will be. Um, and we believe that there is no way for us to meet our national education goals uh, without uh, being much smarter and investing much more in higher education innovation. Um, we can't just take what we have and rearrange it. We need to um, think of new ways um, of education, new ways of organization, new ways of finance. Um, and we are very fortunate to have some of the nation's leading experts on all of those topics here um, to talk today. Um, so we're going to begin um, with a few remarks um, uh, from a good friend of mine, Jamie Marisotis, uh, from the Lumina Foundation. Um, Lumina Foundation is a generous supporter uh, both uh, of the education work here at New America and the Washington Monthly uh, College Guide. Um, and Jamie himself really is one of the nation's leading thinkers and advocates um, for improving talent and opportunity uh, for uh, all of America's students. So we really appreciate um, Jamie coming today, and we will start with a few remarks from him. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Kevin. Got to do the short person thing here after Kevin's up here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, you know, I want to begin first by uh, thanking uh, Kevin and his colleagues from New America. We really are uh, proud partners with New America. Uh, we have a long-term partnership with New America, and our partnership with New America is like many of the partnerships that we have, uh, particularly here in Washington. We believe in high-quality, independent, analytic work that's going to improve the quality of learning, the quality of outcomes that all Americans should get from our post-secondary learning system. And, and New America's uh, approach and expertise is something that we're very proud of and enthusiastic about, and so we, we're very grateful for, for the collaboration. Uh, I want to spend a second just saying something about the uh, Washington Monthly. Um, I'm uh, very happy to have a chance to uh, say a few things about this issue and particularly this, this panel. Uh, I will say that um, as a uh, former journalist wannabe, I've always thought that the Washington Monthly is uh, uh, one of the best in the country, and, and I, really, I really mean it. I think that uh, for years I have said that if you really want to see what the New York Times is going to be writing about in the next three to six months, just look at the current issue of the Washington Monthly and go ahead a few months, and that's what you'll see, uh, see being covered in the national media. And that's certainly true in this space of, of higher education. So. We're really proud to be working with uh, Paul and his colleagues from the Monthly in supporting uh, this work, uh, the, the latest issue of the, um, of the uh, rankings issue for the College Mon uh, the Washington Monthly. Um, you know, one of the things that I like about the Monthly's approach here is that it has really reoriented the rankings game to what I think really matters. In other words, uh, for much of the last three decades, when we've talked about rankings, we've tended to talk about inputs uh, and input measures and reputational factors. Instead of what I think most Americans and most people who try to uh, influence the arc of change in our country really want to think about, which is the outcomes, uh, not on the uh, specific actions of individual institutions, but on how well those institutions actually serve their students and in turn how those uh, institutions are impacting the country through the work of, of those, those students. 
And you know, this year's issue has some wonderful pieces. I particularly want to commend to you the piece that Paul wrote, uh, really the first uh, ever rundown of the nation's top colleges for adult students, which I think is uh, terribly important. Again, these rankings are really based on what, what really matters uh, for real live students, things like transfer and flexibility of class scheduling and support services for students and um, uh, obviously the eventual student's uh, earnings. I think another uh, key feature of this issue and the one that we're here to talk about today is something that I think deserves a lot more attention, which is this idea of innovation in higher education. You know, let's be candid. Uh, I don't think innovation has been higher education's particularly strong suit until fairly recently. This is not something that higher education has done well. I think tradition has ruled the day for higher education for many decades and um, at some institutions perhaps for centuries. Uh, and, you know, in my mind, you know, that's, that, that's just fine. Maybe that's even been preferred for some of those institutions. But I think the facts are the facts, and the facts are that the world literally has changed. Uh, our country's growing uh, need, its demand for talent that Kevin was talking about, the demands of an ever-changing and complex global economy, the sort of seismic demographic shifts that I think so many colleges and universities are, are working on and that we are uh, addressing as a nation, the compelling necessity to address social and economic inequality, all of these things, I think, demand higher levels of educational attainment among all of our citizens, certainly, but certainly among those who have been the most uh, disenfranchised. And, you know, unless we innovate, unless we actually find ways to subvert tradition and forge broader, straighter, more accessible pathways to post-secondary learning for millions more Americans, I don't think we're ever going to meet the challenges that we have to meet as a nation. Now, the good news is things are changing. Um, we can see it in competency-based learning programs. We can see it in the growth and refinement of online delivery, of growing acceptance of prior learning, of the stronger links and partnerships between institutions and employers, some of which we'll talk about today, and in new approaches to financing, particularly student financing, things like uh, income-based repayment. All of these ideas and many more, I think, are very much in play. So, you know, higher education really is being redesigned, not as quickly as some of us would like, but it's happening. And as I said, I think the monthly is a good place to look if you want to figure out uh, where the ball is going to be not too far in the future. So uh, I'm really thrilled to have a chance to uh, say a few words about this, to congratulate the monthly uh, for this issue. I'm going to leave it to Paul to introduce our panelists and, and moderate our discussion. But uh, Paul, I just want to say how pleased I am to continue to be working with you, to have this chance to uh, share the stage with this uh, distinguished group of people. And I'm really looking forward to the dialogue. So thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, Jamie. Can you all hear me? Um, uh, really appreciate the kind words, Jamie. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, Jamie and I started as interns at the Washington Monthly back in the uh, uh, Pleistocene era, I think it was. And, um, uh, and, and just so you know, two of the best books on innovation in higher education were penned by Jamie Marisotis and uh, Kevin Carey. Uh, go to Amazon, uh, type in their names. They're terrific books. Or see the excerpts in the Washington Monthly if you don't want to buy the books. But they're, but they're great, and, and so we appreciate the thought leadership of our partners, uh, seriously. Um, uh, it's great to have partners who are, who are making you think. We have a terrific panel. We have a terrific audience. I took a look at the uh, uh, RSVPs. We've got uh, members of the, uh, we have some staff from the Hill. We have people from the agencies. We've got some journalists uh, from the trade uh, groups. We've got a uh, about 100 people who signed up just to watch the webcast, so a very good audience. hope we get some good Q&A. We want to open it up to your questions. But let's just jump into the panel. Let me do some introductions of these three folks who we profiled in an article in the Washington Monthly called the 16 uh, Most Innovative People in Higher Education. And, and, and when we said higher education, we don't mean just college presidents. There's no college presidents on the stage today. Um, we mean the people throughout higher education who are, who are on the front lines making, uh, trying to cha make changes for the better. Um, change is very hard. It's especially hard in 
higher education. As uh, Jamie said, it's a uh, hidebound, tradition bound. Um, we think things are beginning to change. Uh, we think the pressure from uh, parents and students who are looking at huge debt and ever rising tuition uh, is playing a part. We think the that anger and frustration is bubbling up to the elected officials. They're beginning to put pressure on uh, uh, on state uh, colleges, and the press has gotten in the game finally. So I think the folks that we're going to be talk who are going to be talking to today, who have had to fight their way uh, into making change, are really the wave of the future. So let me introduce them now. Charles Isabel uh, is a professor and senior associate dean of the computer science program at Georgia Tech, where he helped create Georgia Tech's online master's in computer science degree program. I hope he's going to tell us all about that. Uh, Charles teaches and conducts research in artificial intelligence and received his PhD in that subject from N MIT. He's also founder of the Laboratory of Interactive Artificial Intelligence, a research consortium, and in his spare time writes reviews uh, of hip hop albums and was the uh, uh, ran the uh, annual New Jack Hip Hop Awards, which I think is very cool. Um, Amy Leitinen is director of higher education with the Education Policy Program here at New America. She previously served as a policy advisor on uh, higher education at both the U.S. Department of Education and the White House. Um, she was named the top innovator, a top innovator uh, for her work on federal policy and competency-based education by the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, uh, her current uh, work focuses on federal policies to increase quality and transparency. And she has a degree both from a community college and one of the finest public universities in the world, which I also think is very cool. Um, Bridget Burns is executive director of the University Innovation Alliance. This is a coalition of 11, 11 public uh, research universities dedicated to finding new ways of helping students graduate with a high quality and affordable education. Uh, UIA, UIA was uh, developed and launched while she uh, was an American Council of Education fellow at Arizona State University, Arizona State being one of the 11 uh, members of the coalition. Um, and Bridget uh, also has been a national associate for the National Center for Public Policy and uh, an advisor to the Institute for College Access and Success, also a great, uh, uh, another great or organization fighting for change. So again, a fantastic uh, panel. And so I'm just going to turn it over to the panel. And Charles, would you uh, give us your thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, let me say I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm quite honored. Uh, I was asked to talk for uh, about 10 minutes, um, uh, a little bit about the online master of science, computer science. I'm going to do that. Uh, normally, this is an hour-long talk, so I'm going to deal with that by just talking really, really, really <laughs> fast. Uh, as also pointed out, I'm a professor uh, in the College of Computing, also a senior associate dean. So the professor side of me, I'm just going to say a lot of things with a lot of authority. Uh, and as the administrator, I'm going to try to hide some of the things that I don't want you to ask me. So it's up to you to ask those <laughs> questions uh, uh, later on. So why are we here today? What are we talking about? So the online masters of computer science, what is it? Well, very simply, it was our attempt at Georgia Tech to take this, at the time, new technology MOOCs, uh, people were thinking about courses, and try to turn it into a real, actual degree. And there'll be a theme throughout this where the goal here is not just to create a course or to create a simple experience, but to actually take an entire degree program and all the things that come with being a part of a program, being a part of a community, and going through an entire educational experience. We wanted to really understand what we could, what we could do with that. So we delivered online with the MOOC platform. That's a, a part of the, the MOOC part of it. We wanted it to be in every single way possible equivalent to our, uh, to our on campus MSCS program, which is the number nine ranked program uh, in the country. And we wanted to do it with, uh, for the least cost possible. So it turns out that the cost of the entire degree is about $6,600 on average for students going through. Not per class, not per semester, but for the entire degree. That's compared to somewhere between $42,000 and $46,000 uh, if you were to go through the, the program on campus. In order to make this work, it was a collaboration not just with Georgia Tech, but with Udacity, you can ask me about that later, and with AT&T, who gave us a generous gift. We began this program, we announced it in 2013, and we are now at the very end of our third year. 
So why bother doing this? I think the very first question you should ask is why do we decide to go down this path? And there's really just a simple answer to this. It's because we could and it's because we should. It's really that simple. Why can we? We can because the technology has finally gotten in place. MOOCs exist, yes, but it turns out Google Plus exists. It turns out Piazza exists. It turns out that Facebook exists. All the sort of social infrastructure necessary to allow the community building uh, for something like this to actually work has been out for a while and people have facility with it. That turns out to matter a lot. Georgia Tech was particularly well situated to do this because we've been doing this sort of thing for decades and certainly over the last two or three years we have millions of people uh, working, uh, millions of students uh, online who, who work with our program. So we have a lot of experience and we've fallen down and we've gotten up and we've figured out a lot of things. But I think more interestingly for this discussion and the things that I like to think about is that the should part. So we have a mission to educate. We're a public university. Our actual motto is progress and service. And so it made a lot of sense that we would try to do something with access. One thing I think that's very important to understand is that people talk about access and what they really mean most of the time is affordability. And yes, affordability matters, $6,600 matters, but really what matters here I think is accessibility. Most of you probably paid attention to this and you know last year, the year before, Stanford accepted something like 4% of its applicants to its undergraduate program. We have a very low acceptance rate as well. That doesn't quite seem to be what you would want to do. We would want to get to a place where we can actually uh, provide an education for anyone who can succeed. And so one of the goals of this program is to do that. I'll, talk a, I'll give a, a few statistics as we move along. Uh, and I also think that that idea of accessibility and providing education to as broad a set of people as possible is the true test of a university. So my dean likes to tell this joke that the way you can tell a good university from a bad university is that the output isn't much worse than the input. And I think that's true, that if you get lots of good people in and you know that they're going to succeed almost, almost no matter what you do, they're going to succeed almost no matter what you do. So the question is, can we really bring in people we normally haven't brought, give them the opportunity, and still allow them to succeed, and then be judged on our ability to provide them with more? as opposed to with our ability to not take too much away from them. So how do we get to a $6,600 degree? There are a lot of pieces here. There's really two major things. One is we actually sat down and tried to figure out what the cost would be. That was a lot of work. No one's actually been able to answer the question, how much does education cost? Because it's a very difficult enterprise. Do you count the lights? Do you worry about uh, all the flowers that you put in on the beds? What is the pay the professors? What is this incremental cost of adding a new degree? It was very difficult. We brought in the registrars. We brought in all the people across campus, people who deal with compliance. We brought everybody in and tried to figure out what adding a few thousand more people would actually cost us. And then we made the degree work for that cost that we thought that we had. It turns out that we were pretty close to being right. Um, at least if we got to scale, and right now we're at a place where it looks as if the decisions that we made and sometimes the guesses that we made did, in fact, uh, turn out to be correct. The other thing that you have to talk about whenever you talk about education, you talk about what it is to actually fight through and to make innovation, is faculty governance. The faculty have to buy into what you're doing, they have to be able to participate, and they have to help you in this innovation. A president cannot simply come in, a random professor cannot simply come in, a legislator certainly cannot come in and say, thou shalt innovate. The faculty have to participate in that. And so what we did here is we asked the faculty to help us develop this. We appointed a working group. None of the administrators were part of that working group. Eventually, after only a few months, which is record time uh, in, in academia, we got 75% of the college uh, to vote in favor of moving forward, the rest of the institute to do so, all the way up to our Board of Regents, and uh, we were off to the races. There were a few other things that helped us along the way in terms of timing and luck, and I'm happy to talk about that if you're interested, but the main thing was that the faculty were on board uh, by the time we actually uh, went through the process. So I want to tell you a little bit about the program. I think these, these numbers here are actually pretty interesting, and I think they, they tie in with other things we, we might hear uh, this afternoon. We opened up applications for three weeks for the first cohort. We got 2,361 applications in just three weeks. That's more than twice the number of uh, students we get all year round for our on-campus degree. Since we have started, we have well over 12,000 applications in that time period, and we are accepting somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of those students. By contrast, for our on-campus degree, we accept about 10 percent of our students. About 60 or 70 percent of them are qualified, but we just have room for about 10 percent. Here we're able to actually accept everyone we believe who can succeed and uh, all the early evidence is that in fact they, they are succeeding. We have 100 countries, we have people with broad backgrounds, uh, people with PhDs, people with uh, master's degrees in other fields, people who are really sort of participating in this. They're kind of all over the place in terms of age. Uh, in the end though, they are on average about 11 years older than our on-campus students. They are overwhelmingly American. For our on-campus uh, program, uh, we have about 85% of the applicants are foreign nationals. 
vast majority of whom are, are, are from India, followed by uh, China, and only 15% are domestic students. Uh, that is U.S. citizens and permanent residents. For the online, it's exactly the reverse. 85% of the applicants are U.S. citizens, they're older, they're working full time, and they're interested uh, in this degree. I think this is an important point. It turns out that there's a large set of people who would love to pursue an advanced degree, would love to change skills, would love for whatever reasons they have, but they feel like they can't. They have jobs, they're married, they have kids, they have a mortgage, and they can't go away for two years uh, in the hope of, uh, of, of getting some kind of economic benefit at the end. And they're certainly not going to leave California and come to Atlanta because the only thing they know about Atlanta is that it's in Georgia. The only thing they know about Georgia is something about banjos and terrible things happening in swamps because they've never visited. <laughs> Atlanta, for, Atlanta, by the way, is a wonderful city. It's the world's largest urban forest. It's west of Detroit. It's the center of the country. It's beautiful. You should all visit. But a lot of people don't know that, and they're certainly going to uproot their lives to do this, and this gives them an opportunity uh, to do that. So on the enrollments in, at the end of... Uh, uh, these nine semesters, we have over 4,000 students enrolled in the program. We've gone from zero to 4,000 in the space of three years. Worth pointing out that one thing that you might not know about Georgia Tech is it's the largest engineering college in the country by a lot. That is not including computer science, but over the last three years, computer science is now larger in terms of grad students than all of the College of Engineering combined. So there's clearly a huge market out there for, for people who, who want to do this, and if you're able to give it to them, they will, they will try to take advantage of it. We graduated 18 people last December, 60 people last May. We're expecting to graduate 200 people uh, this term, and we're expecting to see a steady state of about 1,000 people graduating a year uh, going forward. The demographics follow exactly the way you do. There's a lot of really interesting things about students, and not just about students in our program, but how they act in their program that I would love to talk to you, talk to you about later. But they behave very differently from what you would normally expect from students. They're not full time. Uh, they're trying to maintain jobs. They're doing all kinds of things that are very different, at least aren't like the students that we normally see at a place like Georgia Tech. The one thing I would want you to get out of this in terms of the students and what actually makes a program like this work, though, is that what students are looking for, again, is not a series of unconnected courses. They're looking for an actual program. And what's really interesting here was not getting the MOOC to work, although that was interesting. What was really interesting here was creating the community necessary for the students to succeed in the program. So the students seek community, they build community. I have lots of graphs that show how much more engaged they are online with one another. If we don't provide them with the resources, they find it themselves. They've created uh, tons of, of, of organizations on their own. Uh, they run around the world taking pictures with one another. They find each other. Uh, whatever country they are, they sit down, they study together, they work together, they talk about the program, and they help each other. They create the campus experience amongst themselves, and we provide enough resources and platform and technology that allows them to do it. But that, I think, is the key and, and the secret to success here. So well, I just want to say just one or two more things before I step down. Beyond the demographics of them, older U.S. citizens and, and so on, they're actually uniquely qualified because they're older, because they're working uh, full time. Many of them are employed by places like Google. Many of them are getting jobs at places like Google uh, because of this program. They are themselves leaders and they want to give back and they want the opportunity to do so. We have students who TA for free. Uh, who want to continue to TA as the, after they graduate and sort of move through the program. They want to be a part of this community uh, and to keep it going. I'll also point out that um, when I say things like, well, it's, they're older, they're, they're different, it turns out they really are older, they really are different, they really aren't the set of people you would normally see at a place like Tech. Research uh, with uh, our partners uh, at Harvard, economists uh, working with public policy at Georgia Tech, shows that effectively the overlap between these students and the students who would otherwise get um, graduate degrees is about zero. So in fact, this program by itself, they estimate is one, the largest program of its kind in the country, probably the largest kind in the world, um, and that will by itself increase somewhere between eight to 10% a year, uh, the number of students uh, with advanced graduate IT uh, degrees, which I think is, is magnificent. And of course, you know, we, we take full credit for that, but I think what's really amazing here is that this has always been here. This opportunity has always been there. We were able to take advantage of it first, and surely there are more similar opportunities uh, that are out there. Uh, last thing I think I will say here is just some of the lessons. Uh, you should challenge me on some of these things uh, later on uh, during the talk. Uh, but really, I think the big lesson here is it's not difficult. It actually isn't very hard to do this. I mean, it's hard. It's hard because you've got to put a lot of work in. You've got to get a lot of people to do the right thing. You have to do quality control. But it's not hard like getting a professor to only talk for 10 minutes when he gets up on the stage. <laughs> it's merely the kind of work that you have to put into it. Just normal, just elbow grease to get you through. Scalability is the key issue here. The only reason we can manage to do this for $6,600 is because we had the advantage of scale. 
Scalability, it turns out, is mostly easy on the day-to-day, -day, but there are some parts that are hard. Grading is the part that is hardest. Figuring out how to build assessments that will allow, allow thousands of people to do something and actually give them proper feedback and allow us to evaluate them without it being incredibly expensive uh, is the difficult part. Building that community is the difficult part. But once you see that it's what it is, the students will themselves, I, I think, participate. So I wanna, I'm just gonna leave you with that idea that what really is going on here is that there's a giant need out there. There are people who want to do this, not just in computer science, but in lots of other fields. If you build it, uh, they will come. And uh, I guess it's worth saying that we're going to continue moving down this path. We're now taking year-round applications. We're doing career services. We're doing everything virtually. We're moving out beyond the United States. I have visited Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, several countries there over the last couple of years. We're building partnerships. We're trying to really live up to this notion uh, of accessibility. Um, and again, if you build it, they will come. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, so, wow, so I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I, don't build, I don't build things, and so I'm excited to be included with people who build things. Uh, what I try to do is, if, I guess my, my take on that is, my little part of the world is, if you get the federal government to pay for it, they will build it and they will come. <laughs> and so sort of my little specialty, I guess my little innovative part of the world, I guess if, if that's what we call it, is uh, trying to figure out how to get the federal government to pay for learning rather than time. And so, and. We won't go into what all of that looks like. There's the Washington Monthly. We wrote a piece about it a few years ago called Cracking the Credit Hour. But Paul wanted me to talk a little bit about that process of, of how do you change federal policy? Like how do you, you know, why am I here? I'm not, I mean, again, I'm not building things. But I guess I would say there are two things that I've sort of focused on. Um, one, I, you know, I'm this federal policy nerd who focuses, who has focused on two words at a time. That seems to be what I like to focus on, credit hour direct assessment, experimental sites. Um, I'm now branching into more words, like four words. Maybe we can talk about that later if people care about it. Regular and substantive interaction is something I'm super excited about, <laughs> super excited about. And so I sort of dig into the, you know, dig into these arcane and sort of bureaucratic words and try to figure out how, how they are problems in terms of giving students what they need. Uh, how it's preventing the federal government from paying for things that students need, and how they can be used as solutions to get students what they need. So that's one. And then I think the other thing that I do is I'm a pain, um, and I really refuse to pick sides. I guess I'm like a super liberal artsy fartsy person. Like I do not have um, it's a PhD in what from MIT? Computer science, right? No, I don't have that. I'm like an associate of arts in theater, a, a bachelor's degree in gender studies. I mean, I do have a public policy master's, but I, I like to see the world in like, oh, we, we can see it through this lens and this lens and that lens, and so I see a lots of both ands. And that's sort of how I think I approach the, the world of federal policy making. There's a lot of your side, my side, right? You have a lot of Republicans and Democrats. You have a lot of legislators and regulators or the field. You have innovators or consumer protection folks. And I try to say, well, I see your point, I see your point. Maybe we should come together and talk about that and, and try to move things. So um, in my former life, I was also a former organizer. So that's sort of what I do, is try to bring people together and say, how can we move this thing together? So, um, so I guess um, talking about, without going to the history of the credit hour, but again, if you want to read Cracking the Credit Hour, feel free. But I was at the Department of Education when the department created for the first time a federal definition of a credit hour, which had been used to give financial aid out for years and years and years, but there was never a federal definition. And to be clear, I didn't work on that. That was somebody else who was working on that. I was working on other things. But you're in a department and like, you hear people talking, and I heard people talking and grappling with this issue. And again, I wasn't paying attention to it, busy with my own thing, but I remember hearing folks talk about trying to thread this needle of allowing for innovation. Like, how do we meet the needs of the students that Jamie was talking about earlier? How do we, how do we create some flexibility so that students can learn at their own pace, you know, and get credit for what they already know um, without being bound to seat time? But how do you also prevent rampant fraud and abuse, right? Like, how do you, how do you thread both of those things? And the folks at the department who are super smart, very thoughtful, really well-intentioned, good, good people, thought they did that. 
I was like, oh, good. I'm glad they thought they did what they did, and I'm doing my thing. And then I went out into the, well, not real world, because I came into a think tank, but <laughs> I left the department, and I went into some other world, and uh, was hearing from folks in the field that they did not feel that way about the department's regulations at all. They were like, this is confusing at best, and it is stifling at worst. It is. And I'm like, no, no, it isn't, because look, there are these three things. And people are like, no, this is terrible. And um, so I basically wanted to dig into that question, and so I did, and then wrote a paper about it, and et cetera, et cetera. But as I was doing that, I was, uh, I talked to a million people. I guess that's what I do, too. I talked to a lot of people who are much smarter than I am. And um, through that process, um, you know, it was like, well, the credit hour is really this problem. How do we get folks to pay for learning rather than time? And after talking to a gazillion people, Talked to one person who was like, well, actually Congress passed this law in 2006 that creates an alternative to the credit hour. I was like, and I had talked to, if not hundreds, nearly 100 people at this point, and people who are very in the weeds on this stuff, and I had never heard of this provision. I was like, tell me more. And they're like, oh, I don't know, it was something 2006. So I went back and sort of digging around and found this provision. I was like, hmm, and then asked other people about it, who, people who you would think would know, people in competency-based education, people who have policy people, people who are very focused on this issue and folks didn't know about it. So then I was like, okay, so now it's an organizing, like we actually have a solution. We have something on the books right now that is law. You don't have to create law. You don't have to get Congress to agree on anything. You can just sort of say, hey, there's this alternative to the credit hour that we can use to create, to basically help competency-based programs. And at that time, Lumen actually held a meeting and there were about, this was maybe in 2011, 2012, there were about a dozen institutions, maybe 15 institutions that were either doing or trying to do competency-based programs, but they couldn't really do them because they didn't have federal money to pay for it. And so we're like, ah, oh, there's this solution. And so brought folks together and, you know, sort of started an organizing campaign, like getting the field to know about it, talking to folks in the department, um, saying, hey, you may not know about this thing, this thing exists, talking to folks in the media and getting, and there were stories written about it, and all of a sudden there was this, oh, here's this thing, and then the department issued a letter and said, hey, colleges, we want you to do this thing. Colleges raised their hand, and then they started to do this thing. President Obama made this big speech on higher education. We should talk about three things that he was going to do to sort of shake up higher ed, and innovation was one of them, and these things that we had recommended in terms of direct assessment and experimental sites, these two words that I love, and <laughs> they're fun because they're only two, uh, were part of the, uh, the president's plan. So that was super exciting. So that's basically sort of what, what we did. And um, what's exciting is we had this meeting a few years ago where there are about a dozen schools. Now there are hundreds of schools and programs that are trying to do competency-based education because they know they can get it paid for, right? You pay for it and they will come. They'll, they'll, somebody will build it if the federal government pays for it. If the federal government doesn't pay for it, it's a little bit hard. If your students didn't get the financial aid, would you be able to offer your courses? Or are they mostly self-pay? They're far more with financial aid than I would have thought. Okay. So financial aid, if you couldn't get financial aid for your program, do you think you would be able to serve as many students? No, absolutely not. Okay. So financial aid matters. So we're figuring out, you know, how to do that. So that's a start. It's a, we have a long way to go and we can talk about, you know, those are the hopes and dreams. A bunch of things have happened. A bunch of things haven't. But um, so we have a long way to go and there are still some threads. Um, but, and the threat is, there are two threats. There's the threat that um, higher education stays the same uh, and that it doesn't help the students who need, who need higher ed to change. And there's the threat that higher education will change and will hurt the students who it needs to help the most. So how do we thread those things? Neither of those options is acceptable, which is why I think we have to rethink our concept of innovation. Um, we can't afford to keep thinking that you're either for innovation or you're for consumer protection. And at least in DC, that's too often the, the those are the, the two camps that people um, put themselves in. So I don't know if I'm innovative or if I'm just irritatingly, I don't, I don't know what I am, but I'm, I often find myself, if not alone, then just in a small little group of folks who are saying, no, it's supposed to be both and. And I think the problem is, and you know, people are, I think nobody likes me wherever I go because you know, I talk to institutions, they're like, why are you defending the Department of Education? Why are you defending the Inspector General? And then I talk to you know, folks in the department, they're like, why are you defending these institutions? And I'm like, well, there are these things that we need to think about together. But I think the problem is that we've focused for so long on the delivery of innovation. We're like, ooh, that's a sexy, shiny new thing, and let's do that. And that's the innovation. When 
I think, as Jamie mentioned earlier, well, what we really need to be focusing on is outcomes. And that's the, that's the innovation. Because if you don't do that, you end up having this back and forth between lots of innovation with lots of promise that ends up hurting lots of students. And then you get a regulatory backlash and then a clamping down. And we've seen it time and time again over the last few decades. In the 80s, we had correspondence education, which was really supposed to help you know, adult students who couldn't go to, to classes and were like, here, we'll mail you a book and you'll, you'll, you'll learn on your own and you'll be fine, you'll get credit for it. And then federal money started to flow and you saw just this increase in these fly-by-night providers who were just coming in and just taking students' money. I mean, giving folks degrees who could not speak English, right, who weren't going to get a job with that degree. There was a correspondence truck driving program that was run out of a fruit stand. I mean, there was all sorts of, like, Craziness. So then there was a backlash. And then in the 90s, you have the invention of the internet, and you have the invention and the possibility of online education, which we have seen has done tremendous things, like incredible, incredible, tremendously innovative things. But also, uh, there has been the ability to scale and to scale exploitation at scale. <laughs> and so we've seen some massive abuses, and we've seen the collapse of, of some, some colleges that were part of that. So, I think as long as we focus, and then we saw this, we've seen a regulatory backlash, right? So I think as long as we focus on the, the innovative, the sort of shiny, ooh, what is that thing, we're going to constantly go back and forth. But if we say the innovation is the outcomes, and we're going to be super tight on that, then we can be much more flexible about how it's delivered, who delivers it, if it's a faculty member, if it's a if it's a college coach, if it's you know the, the who provides what and how they provide it and how many hours your butt has to be in a seat and all of those things don't matter as much if we're like, well, at the end of the day, did you complete? Did you learn anything? And did you get a job that enables you to pay down your debts? Like, maybe that's the innovation. And that is actually a radical idea in higher education. We don't, we don't do that. So I guess that is, that's sort of my hope is trying to figure out in sort of my little piece of the world is trying to figure out how to pay to build things that are all focused on outcomes. And so it doesn't matter sort of who is providing it, how it's provided, but that we are focused on the, on the outcomes. And so that's my story. <laughs> okay, so I'm heading, uh, I'm heading up there. I have some slides. Uh, I found out that, yeah, so 10 minutes, that is quite the challenge. Uh, okay, so we're good. Um, so I was told to talk to you about three things. One, uh, a little bit of a sense of my background and how I'm coming into this work, what the UIA is and what we're doing, and also how policymakers might help incentivize uh, more of this work. So no challenge there in 10 minutes or less. By the way, the intimidation factor of being on a panel of innovators, like I felt like I should show up wearing a ton of, ed like a, 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 a wearable tech and like, you know, like a, like just super edgy everything, and I just, I didn't, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so my name is Bridget Burns, and I have the pleasure of working with these 11 large public research universities that you can see are spread throughout the United States. And they have come together because they are united around a sense of urgency that we're not producing enough college graduates to keep our economy on track in the future. And we're doing a terrible job with low-income students, first-generation students, and students of color. We believe that going it alone to solve those two problems is a massive waste of time, energy, and money. So we work together to innovate, scale up what works, and diffuse everything we learn in the hopes of creating a movement. Uh, so I came to this work. The, this, this alliance came, to, uh, came about because these 11 institutional leaders came together. They wanted to try and create something bigger than themselves, something that was going to solve this massive achievement gap facing the country, and to focus on scale. And I got involved after they had initially met up um, and been organized together uh, by both President Crow and as well as the other institutional leaders. And was, they were supported generously by the Lumina and Gates Foundation for a planning grant. Uh, I came together because I was, I was there as an ACE Fellow. And uh, that was coming on the heels of a, a career where I had spent most of my, uh, my career working and sitting in various seats around the higher education table. Um, as a low-income student leader who was on a presidential hiring committee um, when I was uh, very young, so as a member of a state board of higher education, 
um, observing and hiring and firing and helping support university presidents as a chief of staff and a senior policy advisor for seven institutional leaders um, and being their primary advocate in the legislature. So I'd kind of seen the different ways that higher education behaves and started to see really two driving questions that emerged in my career um, that led me on my ACE fellowship. One was, why is collaboration so painful? <laughs> why is it so difficult to get institutions to work together? Uh, and also, the second one was, is there something truly different about the institutions who we uh, believe are innovative? What is it? What can we teach others about that? Um, I wanted to know because I had heard all this stuff and I'd seen all this stuff, but I, I had a lot of questions. And so I went to learn from the most innovative college president in the country, Michael Crow, at the most innovative university, Arizona State. And when I first got there, they asked me to work on this alliance that was just very much in, a, in the beginning. And they said they gave it a 30% chance that it was going to be successful. And they were OK with those kinds of odds, which is why ASU is as innovative as they are. They are comfortable with risk, and they make strategic decisions around it. So they said, you know, we'd like to see if you can make this work. So I spent that year going uh, not just to these institutions, to about 50 around the country to understand, you know, what do, you, what do institutions believe they're doing that's innovative? How self-aware are they? And how aware are they of what's going on elsewhere? And so what I found uh, when I did this is that campuses fell into basically three categories. Uh, the, the vast majority, when I would ask them what they were doing that was innovative for student success, would point to something that was not innovative at all. And in fact, I'd seen something much better very close by that they were unaware of. Uh, there were some institutions who fell into a category of they were doing stuff that was innovative and they didn't even know it was innovative because that's just how they do things. And again, it's about the peripheral vision of institutions. Uh, and then there were a group that uh, is very small, but they were actively engaging in experimentation and testing and iteration and comfortable with failure and learning from failure. And there was an actual thoughtful strategy around it. And so we're talking about like Georgia State, Arizona State, UT Austin. We have these institutions who have, who have been leading. So it became clear that uh, you know, coming out of that landscape analysis of what was going on while the UIA was forming, um, it became clear that, the three, that there were a few challenges that really we needed to focus on. One, the diffusion of innovation needs to be innovated. Right? The way that we share ideas is focused far too much on coverage and not on transfer. And ideas simply are not spreading. People are not aware of what's going on. And even when they do hear about it, they don't actually have the answers to the questions they would need to take action. Uh, there is no method for scale in higher ed, which is why there's so much tinkering in silos in the dark and replicating experiments and pilots. And uh, while this in, the, the work, it, it seems like more and more when I talk to people on, uh, on the ground, they really want to do this work. They really want to work on student success. They want to help low-income students, first-generation students, students of color. Their jobs are getting in the way because we have an organizational design problem. Universities were not necessarily historically designed around student success, and we actually have to do the really hard work of redesigning many of them around how, uh, what students' needs are so that they can be successful no matter their background. So uh, the, the, the University Innovation Alliance uh, wanted to try and use this as well as a variety of other things that we learned throughout that year. The, the last piece was we had to design our own method of collaboration because historic models of collaboration were painful and terrible or ineffective or they were in name only or just not really going to be adding value to the campus. So the work that we do um, as we came together is, comes into three categories. Uh, innovation, which is the radical idea that 11 heads are better than one. And so we engage in work that we can only do together. Uh, last week, we just launched a 10,000 student random control trial for first generation college students to understand when they get off track, exactly what is it that you can do that will get them back on track. Um, that we would meet what worst clearinghouse standards. This is supported by First in the World, and it's being led by Tim Rennick at Georgia State. So that's a good example of innovation. Um, the bulk of our work is scale, which is we kick the tires at each other's campuses and really get under there to understand what's going on. We look at the data, what's real. And when ideas have truly been proven to work, we scale them up across the country on other campuses. And so an example of that is last year when we started, um, we had three campuses who were actively using predictive analytics, UT Austin, Arizona State, and Georgia State. And now we have nine. And it was 
in less than a year's time. And it, took, it usually takes universities a lot longer time to be able to scale up an innovation that's so complex. But when you have buddies who are alerting you to bumps in the road before you hit them, you can move a lot faster. And so scale work is what we work on. Um, the, the last piece is diffusion, which is you know, part of the reason the ideas don't spread in higher ed is we rely on conferences and white papers and people moving between careers. And the problem with conferences is that people come as individuals. They hear an idea on stage and they might be inspired. And I hope they remember it at the end of the conference. Um, but they don't actually have the answers they would need to take action. And so to come to a UIA convening, uh, we hold them multiple times a year. Uh, you cannot come as an individual. You come as a team. Campuses have to form student success teams that are directly in line with the, the CEO. They're supported by fellows who we support through the resources we raise. Um, the campuses have time while at our convenings to really understand what's going on. They also get time alone, team time, to, you know, kick, to actually engage in discussion about what they want to work with and to build a plan when they return. They go back to campus, they turn this plan with a timeline, deliverables, and exactly who's going to do what to their CEO. So we actually, everything we do is actually around driving action and making things um, understandable. We also put ideas on stage, not titles. So we are focused on sharing about failure. We're interested in sharing about things that went wrong. We're not interested in seeing people spike the football in the end zone, which is usually how things are you know, on stage, tell you about all my amazing things. Um, so our, the way that we diffuse ideas is just fundamentally different, and we hope to eventually be able to diffuse everything that we've learned and give it away. We don't think about this work as uh, something that's just about the UIA. We see this as a movement, and we want to see other campuses engage in this work. Uh, so in the last two years, we've accomplished a lot. Uh, we've, we've raised resources. Every dollar raised, these campuses more than double. Um, and there are just incredibly generous and thoughtful and passionate people on the campuses who are doing all of this work, who are so excited and um, really driving this change. Uh, and, and so we've seen lots of scaling, and there's all this, all this impressive um, the, you know, work that we're seeing. But I would say that the thing that stands out for me is I have a hard time keeping up with how much is scaling. I hear regularly how much a new idea has spread from one campus to another. And these relationships are real, and they're meaningful. And people call each other, and they spend time, and they see each other as colleagues across the country. So going it alone is no longer how things are happening. So I guess the last piece would be, uh, I was asked to tell you what, um, what, college, what, what policymakers can do to incentivize this behavior. Well, one thing, it, well, first off, the, the system is designed to get the results we have, right? So it, let's acknowledge that all the incentives in place right now are driving towards that, so we should question most of them. Uh, but the other piece is that the White House, uh, when they held their White House summit in 2014, that's an example of what you can do. They asked for people to set very big public goals. They tried to encourage collaboratives to come together. And so we used that as an opportunity to uh, share about and, and make a, a big commitment as our campuses. So our commitment was we were going to graduate at least 68,000 additional students over the next decade, and at least half of them would be low-income students. And we just released that we're now on track to hit 94,000 students in that same amount of time. Um, and that we're exceeding our expectations. So what we found is that when universities collaborate, that students win, and we hope other people are willing to take up this work al along with us. <clears throat> well, thank you, panel. Uh, that was great. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jamie Marisotis to uh, come up and join us, and I'm, I'm going to uh, offer a, a few questions, and then I actually want to open it up to you all. Um, uh, Jamie, something you and I were talking about before we came on, and, and that was... You, not, uh, not the joke in Greek. The, 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 no, not the joke in okay, Greek, but we, we, we can talk about that uh, later <laughs> when the camera's off. Um, uh, and that is my sense, sort of the theory of the case in the magazine about this subject is that and, and, and you sort of talked about this in remarks, that you know, universe, our, our higher education system was not built for innovation. It was not built to achieve the goal that Bridget was just talking about of, of student success. Uh, student success was presumed to come out of universities, but wasn't the, the point. The, um, and that one did not see a lot of innovation um, uh, five, 10 years ago. 
and universities got a reputation, rightly so, as among the least, you know, the least innovative sectors of, of the economy. Right. Theory of the case is things have begun to change. Right. And they've begun to change um, in part because folks like the ones on this panel have been banging away at and succeeding at making change that has been noticed, but also because of other factors, politics, economics. What are those other factors, and are, am I right that we're seeing a little bit of a change? Yeah, you know, I think it's a combination of market and public policy factors, right? So the, the demand for talent's rising. You can see it in terms of wages and jobs and, and other factors. You can see it in terms of the ways in which uh, Americans express a desire for higher levels of, of post-secondary learning. And you can see the market uh, with learning being democratized through technology and lots of other means. And you can see it through public policy and efforts to try to expand opportunity, create greater, create greater access and success for students something that's come into the lexicon much more recently than, than uh, the, the access conversation has been, been a part of the, the dialogue. But I, you know, I think it's important to zero in on, on um, Amy's point here about the fact that uh, we need to express some flexibility here in terms of how we get to the outcomes. We need to be really clear on what the outcomes are. And I was really struck by the sort of false dichotomy argument that she was making that this idea that uh, you're either consumer protection oriented or you're, or you're innovation oriented. You know, the same is true with online versus classroom based. The same is true with, uh, you know, free college or free market or pro student or pro faculty or education or training, as if these things are clearly in two different camps. The reality is that if we really want to get to this higher level of outcomes that we want to talk about, we've got to figure out how to determine what the outcomes are in terms of real and relevant learning and how that makes a difference in terms of improving individuals' lives, both professionally and personally, and how that collectively adds up to our collective well-being. And the path to that can be and should be multiple, but I think that uh, this uh, focus on innovation, these two bookends that we, that we talked about here today, are really good examples of ways in which colleges and universities themselves are now innovating, and I think that's really important to acknowledge and recognize that there is momentum there, but that momentum is going to come from outside of higher education. It's going to come, as I said, from the market and from public policy as well, and, and I think that's all for the good. Charles, you um, uh, have been working on, on your program for a few years. Uh, what, what was the driving force behind it? Why is it that you did what you did? W was it incentives from the outside? Was it a group just within the department that said this, you know, this sounds like an interesting and important thing, let's do it. How did it, how did it come about? Where does, where does innovation come from? <laughs> where does innovation come from? So um, I, I, I'll answer the first question, I think, first, which is where, you know, how, do we, how do we get to where we were? Two things happened at once. One is that there was a huge change in the environment in which we were in, right? MOOCs existed, and they were a big thing, and they were highly controversial. Uh, and everyone was trying to figure out what to do about them. Um, and internally, we had actually had a lot of faculty who, for free, on their own time, I didn't talk at all about our business model, by the way, and there actually is a, a sort of business model behind it to, to compensate faculty, but for free, on their own time, uh, they were building courses and just trying to figure out what to do about it. But like most of our colleagues, they didn't quite know what to do, but there seemed to need to be something to do. But we weren't really sure how to get there. So there was the outside environment, you know, by the way, the legend, they're cutting our budget, Republic University, they're cutting our budget, they're yelling at us uh, while cutting our budget, and then we can't educate as many people, and they're saying, see, they can't educate as many people, so let's cut their budget some more, and it just kind of was sort of going, going like that. So there was this sort of nervousness in the air. Meanwhile, we had individuals who were trying to do interesting things, they weren't sure what to do with it. Sebastian Throne, who's the CEO of Udacity, uh, came to us and said, let's make a $1,000 degree. My dean said, that's insane, you can't do it for $1,000, it probably costs $4,000, eventually it costs closer to $7,000. But we had an excuse, we had a reason to try to do something, and I think this is the key part. The outside world was forcing someone to do something. We had the right ingredients to try to do something, and then a few people had the idea that we could be the ones to actually make the difference. Sure, so it sounds like outside political pressure in the form of Republicans coming after your budget was at least some of the incentive. 
Well, the incentive for fear. So, here, so if we if we were if this were not 2016, but this were 15 years ago, you'd be having a conversation about, um, or maybe it's 20 years ago now. You'd be having a conversation about, uh, you know, building campuses in other parts of the world, international programs, making certain that people are, are part, of, you know, global citizens and so on. And those are perfectly valid things. But what typically happens is because someone's coming after you, you react with fear. So everyone has to have a vice provost of international programs and innovation. Everybody has to have some study abroad program because you're reacting, but you aren't actually being strategic about it. You aren't figuring out, well, what is it we actually want to accomplish? What are our outcomes and what do we want to do? And if you're in the right place at the right time because of this outside pressure, you can actually make a strategic decision to do something that you think will make a difference and aligns with your interests. So yes, without the outside pressure, there's no reason to do anything in particular. And even if you have people inside who want to do something, they're not going to basically have the resources to do that thing. They aren't, no one's gonna help them out because you can't do these things by yourself, whether it's certainly not at an individual level, much less at an individual university level. But when those things come together, the right thing happens. And for us, we were willing to take the, what looks like a risk I didn't feel it was a risk, actually, but you know, for a lot of people, they thought it was a risk, and we thought we could actually make a difference. Sure, it might not have happened if there hadn't been other things going on, but internally, you have to be willing to do that and be interested in doing it. The downside of the way you describe it, and I, I think this is uh, actually quite real, is that you're just generating fear. And so people are reacting. They aren't being proactive. They aren't trying to figure out what right. to do. So, so Bridget, you've now worked with at least 11 universities, but you've talked to 50. Um, I, kind of the same question. Where is the motivation coming from? Is it external? Is it internal? Is it some mix? Are people who have always wanted to try something new being empowered by an environment that's more demanding than it was two, three, four, five, ten years ago? So I, it depends on who you're talking about at the institution. Um, so I, the vantage point I look at um, most closely is university presidents. I'm at the point where now I've um, helped hire, fire, represent, work with 27 different university presidents across the country. And what I've found is um, there is a story everyone is telling themselves about innovation on their campus. And you have to find out what your story is. If you don't know what your story is, it's being written without you, right? Um, but there, it, there's, there's no lack of motivation. People actually want to do this work. Um, their jobs get in the way. The organizational design of the institution gets in the way. Um, I mean, the university president, most people have no idea how incredibly difficult their positions are. I mean, they wake up at 6 a.m., they've had a student crisis, there's something going on with a faculty member, there's some media article that's coming out, their board member's mad at them about something, and it's 6 a.m., right? They're scheduled in 15-minute increments throughout the day up until, when I followed Michael Crow around, I went one time, it was, I, I was met at his house at like 7 in the morning, and it was 15 minute increments up until 10 p.m. at night, and I just tapped out. So I don't know how, I mean, these people are incredible. They're very passionate. There's no lack of motivation there. It's really about who has the uh, creativity, who, has the t who builds the team around them to allow them to actually take action. So um, part of what we find is that it's a capacity problem. Like, we, ha we have this, this very damaging belief in higher ed that if I give you another job, that your plate will expand. And it's part of the reason why nothing is happening. It's someone's job. Oh, by the way, on top of that, could you also collaborate? No. Who has time to scan the country and find out what's going on elsewhere? And then also try and you know, communicate what you're doing and make sure it's the right thing. I mean, we have a, a massive capacity problem. I know we have the administrative bloat narrative that's not very helpful. But my vantage point is these people are working incredibly hard. There's no shortage of motivation. It is a design problem. The most creative innovators are the ones who design the solutions around that, that allow them to be successful. So one example of that is like at ASU, um, most people don't understand, don't know that he has this thing called university initiatives, which is like a stable of early to mid-career smart thinker and doers who are basically standing by for whatever idea he has to test it out, to prototype it, to stand it up, and to get it ready to be able to to be to to be real, right? Most university presidents have good ideas, but they have to ask themselves the question of, okay, is this a public affairs issue? Is this a government relations issue? Is this, do I, go, uh, I they, they have nobody around them to just take a random idea and chase it down and figure out a solution. Um, that's not a department. If it was, <laughs> you know, I think we, if people had more capacity, they would be in a better spot. So that's part of how we try to solve this is we've given people fellows where for the first time, there is a full-time FTE, a, a very smart person whose job is to just help shepherd collaboration around student success and actually drive this work. Um, because otherwise it happens like, I mean, 
email communication is holding higher education back, by the way. So it's like, that's a communication method that is like 20, 30 years old that is not actually serving professionals. We can't even get through our inbox at the end of the day and then we're expected to innovate. So I just, I think that some of the problems that you see in the private sector are happening in higher ed. There is no lack of motivation. It's the, what you see are the people who design solutions to allow themselves to be successful. And I can point to lots of examples of that, but I've already gone too long. Amy, you mentioned very quickly that the number of schools doing competency-based education for adults has gone from, I don't know, six to 60 or something like that. Just for the record for the audience, I know some of this, but give us an example or two of a program at a school mm -hmm. or a school that wasn't and now is doing something on higher education for adults that's cool, it's got a cool factor, mm -hmm. And that would not have happened, at, in your opinion, absent the innovation you talked about, which was essentially finding a way to get federal funding for the students. So I think, I, so I'll answer it in two ways. I think for the super innovative, uh, the, the innovators that you're talking about, the folks who are like the Michael Crows of the world, who are just, they're gonna innovate no matter what, some of these things would happen anyway. Where I think that you run into this is really like where you're gonna scale it, right? So like, I'm not gonna sort of try this thing out, but if I can't get federal money to pay for it, I can't really do it at scale. So I'll give you an example of somebody who I think is one of these like super innovative folks, but where the federal aid has helped them. So uh, the president of Southern New Hampshire University, Paul LeBlanc, who in my mind is just one of the greatest, uh, like I mean, most interesting and innovative folks in higher ed. I mean, he does like one thing and then, you're like, oh wow, that's, that would be enough, Diana, that would be enough. And then he does something else, and you're like, oh wow, they have to do that. And then he does something else. And he has done sort of what you're talking about, creating like a laboratory that's separate from the traditional campus where there's just a team that sort of thinks about new ideas. So he got permission from his board to do a competency-based thing anyway, and was trying it, but wouldn't have probably been able to scale it without direct, without this provision, without federal financial aid sort of direct assessment. So, you know, they're taking, Southern New Hampshire, they have their traditional sort of campus, which is like this bucolic, like when you think of traditional higher ed, which doesn't really exist that much anymore, it exists on Southern New Hampshire's campus. There's like, it's New Hampshire, there's like leaves and like people running through quads. I mean, it's just sort of ridiculous. Then there's this like, there's their online program, which I think is still the fastest growing online program in the country. And then there's this competency-based program, which is really different. It's a, it's a sort of, um, Move at your own pace, so it's not X number of hours. You, uh, I think one of, their, one of their students got through their entire associate degree in arts in three months, not the typical student. Um, but it's, you can't just apply to be in it, you have to work with an employer. It's very much focused on the employer side, so trying to figure out what are the skills and competencies that employers need, because employers are always complaining. They're like, hey, we're getting these college graduates who can't read, write, think critically, take, new information and digest it and sort of find solutions. Like, isn't that what higher education says it's gonna do? Which is part of why, which is so interesting to me, this very workforce oriented program is an associate of arts degree, right? So it's like, it's only for people who are, in, who are working at a particular place, a Slim Jim factory, Blue Cross Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, you know, in the healthcare industry. Uh, it's for people in work, uh, and it's an associate of arts degree, and it's very much this um, sort of meeting students sort of where they are, but it's, you know, the competencies are very much like liberal arts competencies, like can you think, can you process things? In addition, can you use Excel? Can you, can you, um, can you do these sorts of technical things? But I think, you know, and they've expanded, now I forgot how many students they have, but they're sort of going all over the place. They're now actually doing college for Rwanda, uh, yeah. college for Rwanda, and they're working in refugee camps. They're doing all this interesting stuff. Um, and obviously the folks in Rwanda aren't getting federal financial aid, but that's just a, another way of saying they're doing really interesting work. But that wouldn't have happened. There's Brandman University who was highlighted in, um, in the Washington Monthly and Lori Dodge, who's the head of the Competency-Based Education Network, has you know, created this program. And again, for these students who otherwise aren't being well served by higher education and trying to now make it not a niche it's thing. It's a little bit like Charles' program. It's a bachelor's of business, right? Right. But you can get it in two and a half years if you right. have some business back. If you right. studied bookkeeping, exactly. right? If you worked as a bookkeeper, right. and it's an accounting right. course, maybe you 
get through the accounting course in a week right. rather than three months. Right. I mean, because I mean, that's the, and that's sort of the beauty of the self-paced competency models, right? It's like traditional higher ed sort of assumes we're all the same and that we we come to we come to college knowing the same things, presuming we know nothing, and that we learn things at the same rate. And none of those things are true, as anybody who sat in my master's classes with econometrics knows, like, it took me longer than it took some other folks to learn, right? And But imagine if we had been able to sort of do those things on our own, I probably would have gotten through the political theory more quickly and could have focused more on uh, the econometrics and my folks who were, you know, like you, <laughs> like you, computer science and econ and math folks, would have zoomed through that part, right? He'd, he'd have zoomed through the political he theory He would have part. too, I know, so you're a bad example, fine, all right, good. But the point is that these, that these models are really especially, I mean, I think for all students, but especially when you're talking about adults who are looking to get that degree to sort of advance, uh, they're, not coming to, they're not coming to college as blank slates. They already know a ton. So why are you making somebody who's been an accountant for you know, 20 years who needs to get to that next level, why are you making them sit through Accounting 101 when they could probably TA it? You probably shouldn't. So maybe they can go through that more quickly and spend more time on the theory. And so the idea, and Brandman is doing this, and it's allowing students to move at their own pace. It sort of meets them where they're at, assesses what they know, it sort of, and it says, like, in order to get this degree from Brandman, it's not you need 120 credit hours of this. No, it doesn't say that. It's like, what do you need to know and be able to do to have this degree? Um, and then, all right, show us what you know. Like, how quickly can you move through the material? And if it takes you two and a half years, okay. If it takes you eight years, okay. But the point is at the end, uh, so it may be faster for some students. It may not be faster for, for other students. But at the end, you actually have this degree that is sort of meaningful, where it's not just, okay, and we know they've sat through 120 hours of something and we can check these boxes, but we feel pretty, we, the students and the employers at the end feel pretty confident that this degree means the students know and can do this. Like, what a radical idea in terms of transparency and quality in higher ed when employers are saying, we're getting, I mean, I don't know how many of you have hired recent graduates, but like looking through like some of these, like, I'm not gonna name any, but like some of the cover letters, you're like, you have a college degree. This is terrible, <laughs> like terrible. So if you could have more consistent and transparent quality, and if you made it flexible, right? I mean, that's a sort of win for everybody. But is, as long as we're just paying for the strict sort of seat time way of doing things, that's not gonna happen. And so, so, that's, so that's happening. And you have more and more schools who are trying to do that and provide sort of, I think, better quality options and more flexible options. And in some cases, more affordable options. And in some cases, more, uh, more affordable options. So I have a bunch of other questions. I want to get to the political part of this. We're a political magazine in the end, but I'm cognizant we have some questions out there in the audience. Um, do we have somebody with a microphone? If, uh, please, uh, can you bring the mic right up to this gentleman? Um, and uh, state your name and your affiliation if you got one. Thank you, Paul. I'm Charles Cobb with Partners for Affordable Excellence, and I have a quick question for each panelist. For Charles, are there lessons for other departments and degrees from the College of Computing, say English, French, business, commerce? For um, Amy, um, most people in Washington have a relatively limited attention span. So how do you really, as a matter of behavioral science or politics, get them off the shiny new thing? And for Bridget, um, is there a role for governing boards at these institutions to help drive innovation to help the presidents and or the faculty? Thank you all very much. Three great questions. Well, I guess you asked me the first question, so I'll start. I mean, yes, there's lots and lots and lots of lessons, but the, the, you know, the, the question is ill-posed in some sense, right? There's the political set of questions. How do you build something like this? There's do you want to choose to build that thing? Once you've chosen to build it, how do you build it? So I think for the last one, it's, it's relatively straightforward. You get everyone involved. You uh, focus on the program and on the community that you're trying to build because that's what's going to be successful. And you kind of keep that goal, goal ever in mind. And something which I think is implicit in a lot of what we've heard here is you have to understand what the outcome is and what it is you're trying to accomplish. Competency is one thing, but maybe there's something else that you're, you're actually trying to make certain your student is going to look like at the end. And if you don't surface the assumptions that you've been carrying around with you about what you want the student to look like at the end, you're going to create a product that's broken and the student won't come out very well. But I think on the political end, the main thing you have to do is you have to get all of the stakeholders involved. If you're going to do something as 
what may not from the outside look terribly radical, but from the inside, structurally, organizationally, is actually quite radical. You need to get all of the people you never think of on board. You have to get the registrar on board. You have to get the people who do compliance on board. The people who are gonna handle all the student complaints and accusations of cheating on board, and they need to feel that they're a part of the process so that when it actually, the rubber actually hits the road, they're ready to, to work with you. And of course, you have to get the, the, the faculty on board uh, because otherwise you're not gonna have anyone to, to deliver the content. So I think sitting down, working out what it is you're trying to accomplish and making certain you bring in all the people that as faculty we typically ignore uh, is probably the single most important thing that we did in getting this off the ground. So I guess I would answer the question about how do you keep policymakers from just moving from shiny object to shiny object? I guess in some ways you can't. And so the question is how do you harness that? Um, how do you harness whatever it is that they think is sexy and shiny and say, no, that's, that's what we're focusing on? And, and then creating a coalition around that and a coalition of, of practitioners and departmental staff and legislative staff and folks who actually get them much more like, all right, here's the next level order of questions and we're like 40 levels deep so that you prevent them from going off the rails, right? So everybody right now is super concerned with student debt and affordability, which they should be, right? So how, how do we sort of take that anxiety um, and harness it? But if you don't build all of those, like the sort of deeper, more nuanced coalition around it, it can go off the rails really quickly. And an example with competency-based education, which you know I worry is becoming sort of like, ooh, the sexy thing to do, and people are like, oh yeah, this thing is competency-based education. So let's pay for it. This is competency-based. No, no, that's actually not. You're just calling it competency-based education. A few years ago, um, maybe two years ago, Alec, the um, American Legislative Exchange Council, which does um, model legislation in a variety of, in probably all states, uh, put as their only higher education agenda item was trying to get a $10,000 degree, um, trying to get states to adopt a $10,000 degree. And they said, you know, the way to do that is to do online education and competency-based education. All of a sudden, conflating competency-based education with online and conflating uh, it with cheaper, right? In some cases, it may be cheaper, but it isn't always. And so that is super dangerous. Like, in my mind, that is, um, not with competency-based education. It's not just cheaper, faster. It's supposed to be better, right? Like a knowable quality. But in order to combat that, that means that you need to have folks on the ground. You need to have like the institutions who aren't just, um, and when I talked about trying to build empathy, like you need folks in the field who aren't just like, oh yeah, I wanna do that and I, you can trust me because I'm a good actor, so let's just go. You need those folks to start thinking a little bit like regulators and like legislators and to be saying, yeah, uh, that would be good for us, but really bad for the field generally. And we can see how that could be really bad for students if a bad actor were to take this and run with it. So I think it is, it, it, it's sort of like saying, oh, yay, we're going to take your shiny object du jour, but making sure that there is this profound group of folks around it with the understanding and the right intentions who help move it in the right direction. But yeah, you let legislators on their own, it's a disaster. By the way, <laughs> by the way, for the record, online education is not cheaper. Right, right. But that's I agree. right. But that is not the um, that is not the perception, right? There are ways to do, to to do really cheap online education. Online education is not inexpensive. Yeah. Right, but there are ways to do it really cheaply. Yes, there are. Right, but so this is but so this is like a perfect example, right? Like, as a, as a, an institution that's doing it really well, it's like what is not necessarily cheaper. But if you create federal policy, let's say or state policy, where you're like we're just going to create online education and we are going to say it needs to be the $10,000 degree, you have all of a sudden now incented and, and made it so that the online education is necessarily gonna be cheaper, which isn't gonna be better. And so we need folks like you saying, mm, we're okay with online education, but no, it's not cheaper. Does that make sense? Um, governing boards, I, I just, uh, I have a lot of empathy for them having been on one. Um, they have 50 different scoreboards and they are constantly afraid of getting sued or missing the ball because they're actually volunteers and this isn't their full-time gig. Um, and so we need to, as a community, do a better job shepherding their attention towards the things that matter. And so that might be things like ranking. So there are some governing boards where, you know, if you look at what presidents are held accountable for, it's usually a list of 50 things. Most of them are contradictory. Um, and that's the starting point. Um, so you need to actually narrowly focus their attention around eliminating the, the uh, performance gap between low and high income students, students of color and white students, first generation and multi-generation students. And so I think any ranking that is valuing the things that really matter for our country is helpful 
but in general, that's where we need to move because otherwise, I know there are some governing boards where they actually are having like a retreat to talk about how to move up in the U.S. news rankings, and you know that's fine. But any any ranking that focuses on exclusivity is literally measuring the opposite of what America needs in the future, and so um, you know anything that we all as a community can do to, you know, these are volunteers and they want to do good and they are giving of their time and so we all need to help them identify the few things that they should actually focus on and I would argue it is eliminating the difference in outcomes across student populations at scale, not by cherry picking, by actually doing the hard work of redesigning institutions around student success. Uh, some more questions. Um, uh, young lady in the back. That's all right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Claire Williams. I'm, I'm at American University right now. And I've been both tenured full professor at a research university and I've been adjunct as well. And I want to suggest that college presidents at this time in history are untethered from student outcomes because of the adjunct or non-tenure track faculty. They are not engaging at that level and those, that's where most of the teaching is being done. It's not monitored, it's not followed, it's not tracked. Adjuncts get less respect than bus drivers and housekeepers. And until this can be acknowledged by college presidents, I don't see reform. And I just ask you in your dialogue to open this question. Thanks. Uh, anyone want to take that? Jamie? No, you know, I, th I, th I actually think that this uh, reform conversation that's taking place in the last, uh, I'll at least say five to seven years, um, has uh, not adequately engaged faculty of all types, uh, tenure, non-tenure, uh, uh, contingent, non-contingent, and I think that's a mistake. I, I really do. I think it is a mistake because I don't think that you can create the change simply from the top down. It doesn't make a lot of sense. You've got to engage the people who are actually delivering the learning to the people who need the learning. And um, now a lot of the innovation that we're seeing is coming from faculty and is coming from uh, faculty that uh, have a lot of motiva motivation to create the change. But at a systemic level, I don't, I don't see it happening. And I think your point is a, is a really important one. I don't think it's one that we've talked a lot about. But I'm more broadly concerned about the lack of faculty engagement in general and what that's going to mean for the pace of change that's required uh, in the system. Please, any, any. I would say that we're asking, uh, that there's a broader question that we need to be focusing on, which is, um, Higher education has a completely unsustainable funding model, and what you're seeing are decisions being made to get by, and it's unfortunately you're seeing in your situation, um, the consequences are felt on a real human level, but you know, the folks that I work with are deeply, they deeply care about every type of faculty member, all students, they're worried about all of these different things. Everywhere they look, there's a regulation or a restriction, and until you run a multi-billion dollar imprinted organization, you really don't understand how complex the decision making is, and that there is actually no villain. And I think that the infighting gives the illusion of progress. But when we, ha when we have factions, when, it's, when we pit people against each other, faculty versus student versus staff versus administrator versus president, it, we're missing the big picture here, which is the sector. We, have, we don't have a sustainable funding model. We have major challenges. We're not producing enough college graduates. We're not doing the job that we need to for the students who are most vulnerable. We have big challenges, and instead of focusing on just institution by institution and, and different identity by different identity, we need to get together and solve these problems on a much more global level. Uh, yes, in the back, this gentleman. Hi. Um, I think Bridget kind of hit on something that's actually very good there, which is that this innovation term is kind of a problematic term in the sense that you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, in some ways, it sets this bar high for, you know, genius level uh, developments on campus, but yet, yet at the same time, some of the fundamental aspects of running the business of higher education are endangered. And, um, you know, we can, we can push these colleges to, quote unquote, innovate, and in some ways, that's, that can be stifling for some colleges because they're not, they don't feel like they have the, the people to be able to do that. At the same time, you know, a lot of the big problems that colleges face is that they just don't have, they just don't have the essential things working. Their student to faculty and staff ratio is out of balance. Um, you know, they don't know how to manage their money. Um, they're not bringing in students and so on. So anyway, it's just a comment which anybody can take yeah. up from there. One, one of the things I, I think Kevin Carey has pointed out uh, in our pages and to me personally is that if you, if you look at 
colleges that are generally not very well run. You know, their systems, uh, you know, they're, they're not, a, you know, the, 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 the loan check doesn't arrive, you know, in time for the students to start the semester. Basic administrative things that go wrong. Those tend to be the, the schools that do the worst in general for the low income, for the first generation student. Um, there's a lot of bad administration out there. I, I, you know, you work with great schools. There are a lot of not very great schools. Um, and to, to your point, um, there's a lot of just basic blocking and tackling that solves a, a huge amount of the problem. Um, and I, I can't speak to the, the general uh, subject of, of predictive analytics, but you know, the, the basic predictive analytics that um, a lot of schools like Georgia State and others are doing, they're not, you know, as they say, rocket science. If a student in their first semester drops two courses within two weeks, that's a red flag that that student maybe is a little lost and doesn't, and isn't going to succeed and maybe they ought to see a counselor. That, again, it's not rocket science, but building a system that actually calls that student up, asks them to come in, gives them some options and so forth, that's an administrative challenge and schools, uh, any school can do it, um, but a lot of schools just struggle with the sheer uh, difficulty of, of just running the systems they have. That's my, uh, my sense from our reporting. Yeah. Running the university is hard. <laughs> I think it's hard to disagree with that. I, will, I do just want to join in with you and say that I do think the word innovative and innovation is somewhat problematic because it means multiple things. I actually feel like uh, the, the pressure to be innovative actually turns into the, the pressure to be new as opposed to the pressure to affect a change. And so I don't get money from NSF if I take something they did and I make it work here. I get money, well, that's not entirely true, but in the large it's true. I, I get money if I say I'm doing something completely new and I never have to worry about it scaling and I have to worry about it getting sort of dispersed out into the world. And that is a bit of a problem. It's much like the notion of fear that I'm just, I have to react to something and appear to be to be busy as opposed to actually trying to solve the problem that I've decided it makes sense to solve for my constituents. Well, this, this is sort of why I, I was going to say I want to get into the politics of this because innovation is important but as every one of you has said it's getting to scale, it's, it's, it's uh, dispersing these ideas and though we need incentives for innovation we need incentives for the rest of the universities to catch up. That's going to come with broader incentives those incentives are going to come from the federal government. They're going to come from state governments. They're going to come from accrediting agencies. Um, uh, so if I can just jump ahead, I'll pretend one of you asked this question. Uh, very quickly, because we've got maybe 10 more minutes, um, what do we, we're about to have a, an election. We're going to have a new president. Um, we've had a fairly active president on higher education in Barack Obama. What do we need at least at the federal level, in your opinion, just to name one thing, what do you want to see out of this next administration to take, to both incentivize innovation and incentivize the spread of the good ideas? Oh, I said something last time. You go. <laughs> <laughs> the bully pulpit is quite powerful. Who you choose to put on stage to testify matters. Actually look at their data. Are they really doing something at scale? Are they really helping low-income students? Or are they picking you know, 17 students and they're talking about them a lot, but it's 17 students, right? Um, so I think the choices that, we, that policymakers make about where they want to shine the light, that really matters. And so I would say be thoughtful about that. Be strategic. Um, and I, you know, for me, uh, every time that we apply for a grant, we find that it's set up for individual institutional uh, behavior. And so it's actually quite hard as a collaborative to apply for grants or to try and build things together. So I think over time, what we would love to see are you know, more incentives for collaboration. So it race is- race for the top for collaborations. Uh, well, just every time that you try and incentivize anything, ask yourself the question, did you design your form so that an institution that you know, is gonna fill it out or is it designed around a slightly malleable kind of weird organization? <laughs> you know? I mean, there's just, a, we have a fairly rigid conception of how action happens and how ideas move forward. So I would just say, um, in general, there are, there's historically, you know, we don't pay for collaboration. 
we rarely have rewarded it up until I think now. We're creating a real drumbeat. So in general, I would like to see more incentives for collaboration and rewarding institutions who are supporting and graduating low income, first generation and, and, and students of color at scale. Amy. I would use William Bell with Macaulay's pulpit. I would bribe or coerce. I would, I would use go where the money is and there's $130 billion a year that the federal government spends on financial aid. And right now, except for like this you know, tiny thing with default rates, for the most part, it's not tied to outcomes. Like, tie it to outcomes. Like, what are the, and make sure that those outcomes are, it's not that, so that the outcomes aren't um, designed in such a way that you cherry pick, but that you really are trying to make sure that we're serving the students who most need the help with higher education. Like, are you actually doing a good job by first generation students, low income students, students of color? Like, are you? getting them in the door? Are you graduating them with, without a ton of debt? And are they able to get good enough jobs that they're able to pay down their debt? Like, how are you doing? And if you're not doing well, you should not be getting federal money, or at least not that much federal money. Like, needs to happen. So, <laughs> I don't have strong feelings about it, though. <laughs> so, I, you know, there's a long answer and a short answer. And the, the, the short answer I'm going to give is, you know, hold everyone accountable, but hold them accountable for what it is they're trying to accomplish. So there's this kind of one size fit all thing that, that sort of happens, and that's what, you know, is the typical complaint against things like regulation, but the regulation is actually important. But when things like accreditation work, they work because they say, here's some minimal standards, absolutely minimal standards, and you tell us what you're trying to do, and we will hold you accountable for doing the thing you're saying you're trying to do. So that's two things. It requires you to be transparent and say, I don't actually care about low-income students, or I care very much about diversity, or I care very much about outcomes of what, how jobs my students get. Be very clear about that, publicly clear about that, and then demonstrate that you're actually accomplishing those or trying to accomplish those goals. And that allows everyone to be different on the one hand while still actually having both minimal standards and real accountability. When accreditation works, it does that. When it doesn't work, it makes us try to look the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, you have to make certain that the universities believe you as opposed to thinking this is some sleight of hand and that really is there's a specific answer that they're supposed to give. Jamie? Yeah, you know, I think um, I, I really agree with, with all of that. I would just add that uh, the next president's got to use a bully pulpit to actually change the conversation so that the conversation is not about inputs and processes and systems, not about schools and, and colleges and universities, but about the outcomes that should matter for students, for individuals, uh, for workers, and ultimately for the country. And in order to do that, the president's agenda has got to be about talent, not just education. It's got to be about how we actually get to that higher level of talent as a country and what the federal government can actually do with the $130 billion in, in, in federal student aid and the money that we have in training programs in the Department of Labor and lots of other places. And think about this in a much more holistic way. I actually think that um, the, um, the democratization of learning that we were talking about earlier um, is a real phenomenon. And the federal government has got to make sure that it incents the innovation in the right kinds of way. Uh, gets out of the way of the kinds of, of innovation that's already taking place in the market and uses its, re its resources to produce the scale that we need, particularly scale in terms of equity for the populations that Charles was talking about, low income, first generation, minority, and, and other populations. So everyone who's still got a question, can you raise your hand? Okay, we have, we have to. So can we just ask, ask, have the microphone go to both of you, um, each ask your question, and we'll, we'll do a kind of a round up here. Um, first, the, the, this, this lady up front. I was gonna follow up along your question. Um, and my question might be, what policy and changes would help facilitate collaboration? Because there is a, the competition, there's rankings, so how do we actually facilitate collaboration be, between universities? Um, and my question is about, uh, I'm wondering about the plan to adjust the traditional model, um, specifically in Professor Isabel's school, uh, to try and close the price gap between the traditional on-campus model that seems so great and the, um, and the online model. Like, because it feels like there's a very large price gap there. And I'm, and I'm wondering if you, also, if you believe that the on-campus students are in some way subsidizing the off-campus students because the prestige of the off-campus um, education in some way probably comes from the fact that there is this very prestigious university that they're tied to. Great questions. Um, open to any of you. Um, I would say for collaboration, you reward good collaboration when you see it. 
Um, and you would you, you be skeptical when you see fake collaboration. Uh, you try and um, highlight it. Uh, but the also the other piece is you can't do this work without a lot of. I mean, collaboration is the unpaid volunteer work that people expect of you, right? So you have to understand that there isn't capacity for it. There's rarely someone who's just standing by to do it. So anywhere you can support, provide capacity. You know, we use our fellows. Um, these campuses, the, there are so many generous, passionate people who are giving selflessly of their own personal time to make this happen, and it's because the collaboration is entirely designed around their needs, right? So there's different models of collaborate. I came from the system world. I saw what wasn't collaboration, forced collaboration, so don't do that. Um, but I, I guess that would be, um, it's not as helpful of an answer as I'd love to give you, but I would say, yeah, to highlight it when you see the right thing and try and get out of the way of, it, uh, of, of, of collaboration being stopped because there are a lot of obstacles to it. And I would just underscore what you said before in terms of the federal government. When the federal government runs competitions, like it did with the $2 billion in money for community colleges under the Obama administration, like the first round, I don't think it was really focused on collaboration, mm -hmm. although I could be wrong. But then in the subsequent grants, like you were given, you were given bonus points. And at one point, I think it was only collaboration. Because right, folks are like, yeah, you can do these one-offs and help this one institution. But really, we, will, we need to create something across states, within systems and states, across states. Uh, getting folks to learn from each other because that's really the only way to scale this. Otherwise, it's just all right. We can go and give money to every of the you know seven thousand five hundred institutions, okay, and then hope for the best. That's probably not going to happen in this fiscal environment or any other fiscal environment that we are likely to live in in the next hundred years. So, how do you figure out how to maximize the resources you have? Yeah, I, th I think that race to the top it will go down as something students of of public administration will be studying for a long time. It was it showed. Uh, you know, tremendous power to leverage a substantial but not infinite amount of government money into some very broad-based change. Um, and you know, if we can find a way to open the spigot and create some of these buckets of money again and tap that idea, we could. We uh, proposed it for higher ed in one of the Obama budgets, but Congress wasn't that into it. Yeah, yeah, it's a change. <laughs> and on the gentleman's question about uh, the gap between online and traditional, and whether. Uh, the latter is right in the coattails of the, the former is right in the coattails of the latter. So, of course it is, but then every new program that we create at Georgia Tech is riding on the coattails of the, of the, of the, of the, um, of the reputation of the rest of Georgia Tech. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What it allowed us to do is it allowed people to say, well, maybe this is an actual opportunity and it's a real thing because I trust the brand that is Georgia Tech, which is something we have put a lot of time and energy into earning. So I'm okay with that. I don't actually think that's a problem. On the subsidy question, the answer is not really because it's only subsidizing because it came first. Right? So the buildings already exist, the register already exists, the infrastructure already exists. So I get the cost as incremental cost as opposed to just starting from scratch. So it's not really subsidizing it in the way that I think that, that you meant. And in fact, what's happening on campus is as we create more and more of these courses, I teach two of them on the, on the online uh, MS. Um, we're at about 30 of these courses now. The students who are on campus want that experience. They actually look at, my, so I teach an on-campus course in my machine learning course. I have about 300 students in it. Uh, every single one, almost every single one of them looks at my online course for free because uh, we provide it for free, and they use that as a way of studying, they use that, and then they come to me and they ask questions in class as opposed to just listening to me lecture. And so it's actually benefiting the um, on-campus students, a sort of flipped classroom model, except it's not quite, I didn't go, go as far as a, a lot of people do. So I guess I just don't um, worry about the problem as you describe it. I actually think it's a, a pretty significant opportunity that we can take the technology and the things that we're able to do that's very not cheap. Uh, technology uh, that we've got and uh, you uh, that we got um, to actually make the on-campus experience better and as for the rest of it I, I don't think it actually matters it's all about sort of the incremental cost given where we currently are and the incremental benefit so we've come to the end um, if uh, any final thoughts from our panels um, I want to thank you guys I want to thank uh, New America for uh, their uh, great partnership and their great space I want to thank uh, Lumina Foundation um, our uh, first and most uh, 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 decisive supporter of what we do. I want to thank the Kresge and Gates Foundations, also big supporters of our higher education. I want to thank the audience and everybody online. Um, and uh, let's give a big round of applause to the panel.
Can't forget to fall asleep.